Thank you. Is my audio all right? Slides okay? Thanks. Um, so uh, this is uh, our work that we did in uh, training of AIs to detect infected cells. Um, uh, the, the NSF made a call in 2020 for to develop um, innovative technologies to address the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, our company, Vicky, is a cloud-based imaging and analysis platform. And so we have a lot of expertise in developing cell-based assays uh, for microscopy and other kinds of imaging, um, especially using AIs. And to deploy this in the cloud so that we have uh, little impact on uh, local storage uh, and equipment and then software um, requirements. The reason, so the basis of the grant was to answer the question, can we detect virus infection in bright field microscopy images? Um, the reason this is important is that um, measuring infectivity of a virus or a uh, viral infectivity assay are uh, critical workhorses in the drug development industry, uh, evaluating vaccines, monitoring how uh, vaccinated people respond to variants. Um, they all rely on measuring how infectious a particular virus is that's either been treated both an antiviral or with serum from a vaccinated individual, et cetera. So they're a uh, key um, assay in the uh, virology field. And if you can do this um, using images of bright field uh, microscopy, bright field microscopy is very easy to arrange. It plugs in easily into a lot of automation equipment that's already used in the drug industry. Um, so that was the basis for proposing this uh, question that we would answer. Um, the reason why we thought we had a good shot at being able to detect these infections is because uh, when people look at infected cells, uh, in the uh, electron microscope, which we're looking at here, um, you see um, the development of these fairly large structures. Um, the key thing really is the size um, because uh, electron microscopes are not a practical <laughs> instrument for doing an assay because they're extremely expensive and finicky. Uh, but if you can detect things that are large enough, then you should be able to see them in a standard light microscope. And even if you can't really see them and image them, they should have an impact uh, on the images from a regular microscope that you should be able to train an AI to detect. Even if you can't see them, we can see them ourselves. So all these different viruses uh, have uh, formed these structures when they infect cells. This is important because different viruses have different lifestyles of how their infection proceeds depending on their genome and whether or not they have an envelope. So um, viruses either come in with an RNA genome or a DNA genome, and they either have a membrane envelope or not. And this uh, effect seems to be universal across these different lifestyles. Um, so if we can do this, um, the uh, benefits would be that we would be looking at a first round of infection in cells as a contrast in with other ways of doing infectivity assays. Um, uh, there's fewer processing steps because we would be doing this on large cells. Um, we would also, because uh, the assay is uh, read out by a machine, um, there would be, uh, we would eliminate person to person variation. Uh, we produce uh, quantified uh, numerical results about the assay. Um, and because of the way it's deployed, it would be uh, automated and scalable, which would uh, allow this to more easily plug into the drug discovery industry. Um, so to compare to current assays that are used to measure infectivity, they essentially all of them rely on a very long incubation period because the detection is to detect dead cells. Um, and as dead cells accumulate, you count that as a positive infection. Um, in contrast, we're detecting individual infected cells before they die. So number one, we, uh, the incubation time is 
much shorter. And number two, a lot of viruses that are pretty important, they don't actually kill cells. A good example of that is HIV. Um, it produces what's called a latent infection where cells uh, kick out virus at a certain rate and they um, die of natural causes, let's say. Um, so compared to all these current assays, this would be a much, much faster turnaround time for the results, which of course lets you iterate faster over, um, let's say, testing new drugs. So um, the way this works is fairly easy to set up. We have, because of our experience in uh, automatically training AIs and doing this with relatively small amount of data. Uh, you can do this on a, a common format plate. This is a, uh, called a microtiter plate. The, each well on here contains cells and varying amounts of virus. And um, uh, with uh, using two-fold dilution. So uh, you, there are also machines that will image um, these plates. Um, so it's like a robot microscope that lives in a box. It produces a bunch of images. These get uploaded, then all of this stuff happens automatically on, in the cloud. Uh, there's Importantly, there's nothing for the user to adjust in terms of how the AIs are to be trained. Um, and then the result of that is a report of uh, how well this worked, which is sent back to the um, researcher by email. Um, so um, an important thing here about AIs interpreting images is that, um, so on the left, we can see a microscopy image of cells that are um, uninfected and then much later in infection. And you can see that eventually, in this case, at least cells um, begin to die. And you can very obviously see that. And that's what most uh, existing infectivity assays rely on. Whereas if you use an AI, uh, and you compare in the upper right uninfected versus infected cells at two hours, uh, you can see by eye there's not a lot of difference, but the AI that's trained on in, to recognize infected cells can discriminate them uh, fairly accurately. Later on at eight hours, uh, the accuracy increases. You start to maybe see some effects. In this case, this is uh, influenza. One of the effects it has is it causes cells to fuse. Uh, and you might be seeing some events here. Um, the, uh, the other thing to recognize is that we haven't told the AI what to look for. We just presented it with images of infected and uninfected cells, and it figured out what the difference between those images is on its own. We don't really know what it's looking at. Um, I mean, we can kind of guess or figure that out sometimes, usually not actually. Um, so um, that's kind of how a lot of AIs work. We don't really need to tell them what to look for. Um, this is uh, what you get back. It's an auto-generated report um, that explains how the AI training went and what its ultimate accuracy was. But the really important thing is this calibration curve. So the dilutions that are provided by the researchers are on the x-axis here. And then the response of the AI, the numerical response of the AI is on the y-axis. And you can see that um, as you dilute out the virus, eventually the assay stops working and that's its detection limit out here. And then uh, at the high end, when, uh, there's not gonna be a lot of difference infecting a cell once or twice or 10 times. And so eventually you will saturate the infection and that's the upper bound of the range of the assay, which is reported to the user as this green bar. So this tells the user uh, the target uh, dilution that they should use in order to get a pre uh, reliable reserve result from the AI. So like I said, there are different viruses of different lifestyles. Um, uh, very importantly, um, uh, dependent on their uh, what their genome is and whether or not they have a membrane. Um, uh, we have examples now of every kind of virus, about 10 um, different viruses. 
uh, including Corona 229E, which is a cousin of SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. Uh, we haven't actually tried COVID-19. That's a, a, a high isolation virus. Those facilities are growing in number, but they're very highly oversubscribed still. Uh, but we do have on deck uh, a couple of collaborators that will collect data on uh, SARS-CoV-2 soon. Um, but there's a lot of uh, other important viruses in here, uh, in here that are of interest in um, for vaccines, drug discovery, et cetera. Um, and they all work fairly well in our assay. So just to summarize, the um, being able to detect infected cells with Brightfield uh, lets you have a very fast um, assay um, that has few processing steps. It's cheap um, uh, and it's very fast turnaround. Uh, it's objective. Um, it produces numerical results that don't vary from person to person. Um, and it's uh, scalable to automated drug discovery systems that are prevalent in the industry. Um, if you're interested in more about Viki or about this assay, uh, there's some links down here uh, to contact us or visit our websites. Lastly, I'd like to thank our collaborators. Uh, we jokingly say that uh, we don't have a lab, we don't even have computers, everything's in the cloud. Um, so we rely heavily on all of our wonderful collaborators in academia and in industry to provide us with um, to grow cells and infect them, provide us with images. <laughs>